Hello and welcome back to Classic Books with Jamie, Lily, Ostara, Chloe, Bella. As always, I want to remind you to please stay safe, healthy, hit that like button, subscribe, comment below, and the notification bell. And with that, we are going to get back into Stephen King's The Shining and see you in a minute. Okay, here we are again this week. We are on chapter 28, which was her. And we're still on. Well, anyway, let's get there. Jack had stood on the stairs listening to the crooning, comforting sounds coming muffled through the locked door and slowly his confusion had given way to anger. Things had never really changed, not to Wendy. He could be off the juice for 20 years, and still, when he came home at night, and she embraced him at the door, he would see, sense, that little flare of her nostrils as she tried to divine scotch or gin from riding the outbound train. Fumes riding the outbound train of his exhalation. She was always going to assume the worst. If he and Danny got in a car accident with a drunken blind man who had had a stroke just before the collision, she would silently blame Danny's injuries on him and turn away. Her face, as she had snatched Danny away, it rose up before him, and he suddenly wanted to wipe the anger that had been on it with his fist. She had no goddamn right. Yes, maybe at first. He had been lost. She had done terrible things. Breaking Danny's arm had been a terrible thing. But if a man reforms, doesn't he deserve to have his reformation credited sooner or later? And if he doesn't get it, doesn't he deserve the game to go with the name? If a father constantly accuses his virginal son, daughter of screwing every boy in junior high, must she not at last grow weary enough of it to earn her scoldings? And if a wife secretly, and not so secretly, continues to believe that her teetotaling husband is a drunk, he got up, walked slowly down to the first floor landing, and stood there for a moment. He took his handkerchief from his back pocket, wiped his lip with it, and considered going down and pounding on the bedroom door, demanding to be let in so he could see his son. She had no right to be so goddamn high-handed. Well, sooner or later she'd have to come out, unless she planned a radical sort of diet for the two of them. A rather ugly grin touched his lips at the thought. Let her come to him. She would in time. He went downstairs to it, the ground floor, stood aimlessly by the lobby desk for a moment, then turned right. He went into the dining room and stood there, and stood just inside the door. The empty tables, their white linen cloths neatly cleaned. And pressed beneath their clear plastic covers, glimmered up at him, and their and pressed beneath their clear plastic covers, glimmered at up at him. All was deserted now, but dinner will be served at eight p.m. Unmasking and dancing at midnight. Jack walked among the tables, momentarily forgetting his wife and son, upstairs forgetting the dream, the smashed radio, the bruises. He trailed his fingers over the. Lick plastic dust covers, trying to imagine how it must have been on that hot August night in 1945. The war won, the future stretching ahead so various and new, like a land of dreams. The bright and party-colored Japanese lanterns hung on the whole length of the circular drive. The golden-yellow light spilling from these high windows that were now drifted over with snow. Men and women in costume, here a glittering princess, there a high-booted cavalier, Flash, flashing jewelry and flashing wit everywhere, dancing liquor flowing freely, first wine and then cocktails and then perhaps boiler makers. The level of conversation going up and up and up until the jolly cry rang out from the bandmaster's podium, the cry of unmask, unmask. And the red death held over, held sway. He found himself standing at the other side of the dining room, just outside the stylized batwing doors of the Colorado Lounge, where on the night, on that night in 1945, all the booze would have been free. Belly up to the bar, partner, the drinks are on the house. He stepped through the batwings and under the deep, folded shadows of the bar, and a strange thing occurred. He had been here before once to check the inventory sheet Almond had left, and he knew the place had been stripped clean. The shelves were totally bare, but now... Lit only murkily by the light which filtered through from the dining room, which was itself only dimly lit because of the snow blocking the windows. 
He thought he saw ranks and ranks of bottles twinkling mutely behind the bar, and siphons, and even beer dripping from the spigots of all three highly polished taps. Yet he could even smell beer, that damp and fermented and yeasty odor, no different from the smell that had hung finely misted around his father's face every night when he came home from work. Eyes widening, he fumbled for the wall switch, and the light, intimate bar lighting came on, circling circles of me, of 20 watt bulbs planted on the tops of the three wagon st wheeled chandeliers overhead. The shelves were all empty. They had not even as yet gathered a good coat of dust. The beer taps were dry as were the chrome drains beneath them. To his left and right, the velvet upholstered booths stood like men with high backs, each one designed to give a maximum privacy to the couple inside. Straight ahead across the red carpeted floor, forty bar stools stood around the horseshoe shaped bar. Each stool was upholstered in leather and embossed with a cattle branch circle H Bardy bar that was fitting, rocking W Lazy B. He approached it, giving his head a little shake of bewilderment as he did so. It was like that day on the playground when but there was no sense in thinking about that. Still he could have sworn he had seen those bottles vaguely, it was true. The way you see the darkened shapes of furniture in a room where the curtains have been drawn, mild glints on glass. The only thing that remained was that smell of beer, and Jack knew that was a smell that faded into the woodwork of every bar in the world after a certain period of time, not to be eradicated by any cleaner invented. Yet the smell here seemed sharp, almost fresh. He sat down on one of the stools and propped his elbows on the bar's leather cushion edge at his left hand was a bowl for peanuts, now empty of course, the first bar he'd been in for 19 months, and the damned thing was dry, just his luck. All the same, a bitterly powerful wave of nostalgia swept over him, and the physical craving for a drink seemed to work itself up from his belly to his throat to his mouth, and nose shriveling and wrinkling the tissues as it went, making them cry out for something wet and long and cold. wet long gold. He glanced at the shells again, and while the rational hot about the shells were just as empty as before, he grinned in pain and frustration. His fists clenching slowly made minute scratchings on the bar's leather padded edge. Hi, Lord, he said. A little slow tonight, isn't it? Lloyd said it was. Lloyd asked him what it would be. Now, I'm really glad you asked me that, Jack said. Reality, really glad. Because I happen to have two twenties and two tens in my wallet, and I was afraid they'd be sitting there until sometime next April. There isn't a 7 Eleven around here, would you believe it? And I thought they had 7 Elevens all on the fucking moon. <laughs> Lloyd sympathized. So here's what Jack said You set me up an even 20 martinis, and even 20 just like that. Kazang. One for every month I've been on the wagon, and one to grow one. You can do that, can't you? You aren't too busy. Lloyd said he wasn't busy at all. Good man. You line those Marti Martians up right along the bar, and I'm going to take them down, one by one. White man's burden, Lloyd, my man. Lloyd, Lloyd turned to the, do the job. Jack reached into his pocket for his money clip and came out with an excedrin bottle and said his money clip was in the bedroom bureau. Of course, his skinny sh shank's wife had locked him out of the bedroom. Nice going, Wendy. You were bleeding, bitch. I seem to be momentarily light, Jack said. How's my credit in this joint? Anyhow, Lloyd said his credit was fine. That's super. I like you, Lloyd. You were always the best of them. Best damn barkeep between Bar and Portland, Maine. Portland, Oregon, for that matter. Lloyd thanked them for saying so. Jack thumped the cap from the Excedrin bottle, shook two tablets out, flipped them into his mouth. A familiar acid-compelling taste flooded in. He had a sudden sensation that people were watching him curiously and with some contempt. The booth behind him were booths behind him were full. They were graying, distinguished men and beautiful young girls, all of them in costume, watching the sad exercise in the dramatic arcs with cold amusement. Jack whirled on the stool. On his stool, the booths were all empty, stretching away from the lounge door to the left and <coughs> right. Excuse me. On the line on his left corner, and to flank the bar's 
push you curved down the short length of the room. Padded leather seats and backs. Gleaming dark formica tables and ashtray in each one. A book of matches in each ashtray. The words Colorado Lounge stamped on each in gold leaf above the bat wing color and bat wing door logo. He turned back, swallowing the rest of the dissolving excedrin with a grimace. Lord, you're a wonder, he said. Set up already. Your speed is only exceeded by the soulful beauty of your Neapolitan eyes. Salud, Jack. Contemplated the twenty imaginary drinks, the martini glasses, blushing droplets of condensation, each with a swizzle poked through a plump green olive. He could almost smell gin in the air. The wagon, he said. Have you ever been acquainted with a gentleman who... He was hopped up on the wa who was hopped up on the wagon. Lord loud as how he had met such men from time to time. Have you been ever renewed acquaintance with such a man? After he stepped hopped back off, Lloyd could not in all honesty recall. You never did that then Jack said. He curled his hand around the first first drink, carried his fist to his mouth, which was open, and turned his fist up. He swallowed and then tossed the imaginary glass over his shoulder. The people, people were back again, fresh from their costume ball, studying him, laughing behind their hands. He could feel them. In the back, if the back bar had featured a mirror instead of those damn stupid empty shelves, he could have seen them, let them stare, fuck them, let anybody stare who wanted to stare. <sighs> no, you, ne you never did, said Lloyd. Few men ever returned from the fabled wagon, but those who do come with a fear tale to tell when you jump on it seems like the bright, brightest cleanest wagon you ever saw with ten foot wheels to keep the bed of it high out of the gutter where all the drunks are laying around with their brown bags and their thunderbird and their granddad flashes pop skull, skull bourbon the, you're all you're away from all the people who throw you nasty looks and tell you to clean up your act or go put it on Put it on in, in another town from the gutter. That's the fr finest looking wagon you ever saw, Lloyd, my boy. All hung with bunting and brass band in front, and my and my boy all in front, and three majorettes to each side, twirling their batons and flashing their panties at you. Man, you gotta get on that wagon and away from the juicers that are straining canned heat and smelling their own puke to get high again and poking along the gutter for both butts with half an inch left below the filter. He drained two more imaginary drinks and tossed the glasses back over his shoulder. He could almost hear them smashing on the floor. God damn if he wasn't starting to feel it high. It was the Excedrin. So, you climb up, he told Lloyd, and you, and ain't you glad to be there? My God, yes, that's affirmative. That wagon is the biggest and best float in the whole power... <coughs> whole, excuse me, best float in the whole parade. And everybody is... Lining the streets and clapping and cheering and waving all for you except for the winos passed out in the gutter. Those guys used to be your friends, but that's all behind you. He carried his empty fist to his mouth and sluiced down another. Four down, sixteen to go, making another, making excellent progress. He swayed a little on the stool. Let him stare. That was how they got off. Take a picture, folks. It'll last longer. Then you start to see things, Lordy, my boy. Things you missed from the gutter. Like how the floor of the wagon is any is nothing but straight pine boards, so fresh, they're still bleeding sap. And if you look your shoes, and if you took your shoes off, you'd be sure to get a splinter. Like how the only furniture in the wagon is these long benches with high backs and no cushions to sit on. And in fact, they're in fact they are nothing but pews with a songbook every few feet or so. Like how all the people sitting on the, in the pews on the wagon are those are these. Flat chested out bird hose in long dresses with a little lace around the collar, and the hair pulled back into buns until it's so tight you can almost hear it screaming. And every face is flat and pale and shiny, and they're all singing, Shall we gather at the river, the beautiful, the beautiful, the river? And I'm up front, there's these reeking, there's this reeking bitch with blonde hair playing the organ. Tell him to sing louder, sing louder, and somebody slams a songbook into your hand and says, Sing it out, brother, if you expect to stay on this wagon. You've got to sing morning, noon, and night, especially at night. And that's when you realize what the wagon really is, Lloyd. It's a church with bars on the windows, a church for women in prison for you. 
He stopped. Lloyd was gone. Worse still, he had never been there. The drinks had never been there. Only the people in the booths. The people from the costume party, and he could almost hear their muffled laughter as they held their hands to their mouths and pointed. Their eyes sparkled with cruel pinpoints of light. He whirled around again. Leave me alone. All the booths were empty. The sound of laughter died like a stir of autumn leaves. Jack stared at the empty lounge for a tick of time. His eyes widened dark. Your pulse beat noticeably in the center of his forehead. In the very center of him, a cold certainty was forming, and the certainty was that he was losing his mind. He felt an urge to pick up the bar, stool next to him, reverse it, and go through the place like an avenging whirlwind. Instead, he whirled back around to the bar and began to bellow. Roll me over in the clover. Roll me over, lay me down, and do it again. Danny's face rose before him, Danny's normal face, lively and alert, the eyes sparkling and open, but the catatonic, zombie-like face of a stranger, the eyes dull and opaque, and the mouth pursed, ba pursed babyishly around his thumb. What was he doing sitting there and talking to himself like a sulky teenager? When his son was upstairs someplace, acting like something that belonged in a padded room, acting the way Wally, Wally Hollis said Vic Stinger had been before... The man in the white coats had come to, had to come and take him away. But I never put a hand on him. God damn it, I didn't. Jack, the voice was timid but hesitant. He was so startled he almost fell off the stool, whirling it around. It around. When he was standing just inside the bat wing doors, Danny cradled in her arms like some <coughs> waxen horror show dummy. The three of them made a tableau that Jack felt very strange, strongly. It was just before the curtain of Act Two in some old-time temperance play, one so poorly mounted that the prop man had forgotten to stock the shelves of the den of iniquity. I never touched him, Jack said thickly. I never have since the day I broke his arm, not even to spank him. Jack, that doesn't matter now. What matters is this matters, he shouted. He brought one fist crashing down in the bar, hard enough to make the empty peanut dishes jump. It matters, goddammit, it matters. Jack, we have to get him out off the mountain. He's... Danny began to stir in her arms. The slack, empty expression on his face had begun to break up like a thick mat of ice over some buried surface. His lips twisted as if it had some weird taste. His eyes widened. His hands came up as if to cover them and then dropped back. Abruptly, he stiffened in her arms. His back arched into a l bow, making Wendy stagger, and he suddenly began to shrink mad sounds that escaped his straining throat in bolt after crazy echoing bolt the sound seemed to fill the empty downstairs and come back at them like a banshee's there might have been a hundred da dannys still all screaming at once jack she cried in terror oh god jack what's wrong with him he came off the stool numb from the waist down more frightened than he had ever been in his life what hole had his son poked through and into what dark nest and what had been in there to sting him. Danny, you were Danny. Danny sighed and broke his mother's grip. Sudden force strength that gave him her no choice, chance to hold him. She stumbled back against one of the bottles and nearly fell into it. Daddy, he screamed, running from Jack. His eyes huge and frightened. Oh, Daddy, da Daddy, it was her. Her, her. Oh, Dad. He slammed into Jack's arms like a blunt arrow making Jack rock on his feet. Danny clutched. At him furiously at first, seeming to pummel him like a fighter. Then clutching his belt and sobbing against his shirt, Jack could feel his son's face hot and working against his belly. Daddy was hurt. Jack looked up into Wendy's face. His eyes were like small silver coins. Wendy? So, always saw nearly pure purring. Wendy, what did you do to him? Wendy stared back at him in stunned disbelief, her face pallid. She shook her head. Oh, Jack, you must know. Outside it began to snow again. That's the end of chapter 28, and we're on to 29, Kitchen Talk. Let me put that down there. Kitchen Talk. Jack carried Danny into the kitchen. The boy was still sobbing wildly, refusing to look up from Danny's chest, from Jack's chest, that is. In the kitchen, he gave Danny back to Wendy, who still seemed stunned and disbelieving. Jack, I didn't, I don't know what he's talking about. Please, you must believe that. I do believe it, he said, although he had to admit to himself that it gave him a certain amount of pleasure to see the 
the shoe switched to the other foot with such dazzling, unexpected speed, but his anger at Wendy had been only a passing gut twitch. In his heart, he knew Wendy would pour a can of gasoline over herself and strike a match before harming Danny. The large tea kettle was on the back burner, poking along on low heat. Jack dropped the tea bag into his own large ceramic cup, poured hot water halfway. Got c cooking sherry, don't you? He asked Wendy. What? Oh, sure, two or three bottles of it, which covered. She pointed, and Jack took one of the bottles down, poured a hefty dollop into the teacup, put the sherry back, and, fr and filled the last quarter of the m cup with milk. Then he added three tablespoons of sugar and stirred. He brought, brought it to Danny, who sobs had taped it off, tapered off into s to sought to snifflings and hitchings. But his trembling all over, and his eyes were wide and starey. What do you think? What? I want you to drink this dog, Jack said. It's going to taste frigging awful, but it'll make you feel better. Can you drink it for your daddy? Danny nodded that he could and took the cup. He drank a little, grimaced, and looked questioningly at Jack. Jack nodded, and Danny drank again. Wendy felt the familiar twist of jealousy somewhere in her middles, knowing the boy would not have drunk it for her. On the heels of that came an uncomfortable, even startling thought. Had she wanted to think Jack was to blame? Was she that jealous? It was the way her mother would have thought that was the really horrible thing. She could remember a Sunday when her dad had taken her to the park, and she had toppled from the second tier of the jungle gym, cutting both knees. When her father brought her home, her mother had shrieked at him. What did you do? Why weren't you watching her? What kind of a father are you? She had bounded, hounded him to his grave by the time he divorced her. It was too late. She had never even given Jack the benefit of the doubt, not the smallest. Wendy felt her face burn, yet knew with a kind of helpless finality that if the whole thing were to be played over again, she would do and think the same way. She carried part of her mother with her always, for good or bad. Jack, she began, not sure if she meant to apologize or justify. Either she knew it would be useless. Not now, he said. It took Danny fifteen minutes to drink half of the big cup's con contents. By that time, he had come visibly. The shakes were almost gone. Jack put his hands solemnly on his knee's sho son's shoulders. Danny, do you think you can tell us exactly what happened to you? It's very important. Danny looked from what Jack to Wendy, then back again. In the silent pause, their setting and situation made themselves known. The whoop of the wind outside, driving fresh snow down from the northwest. The creaking and groaning of the old hotel as it settled into... Another storm, the fact of their disconnect came to Wendy with unexpected force, as it sometimes does, like a blow under his heart. I want to tell you everything, Danny said. I wish I had before. He picked up the cup and held it as, as if comfortably com comforted by the warmth. Why didn't you, son, Jack, brush Danny's sweaty, tumbled hair back gently from his brow? Because Uncle Al got you the job, and I couldn't figure out how it was good for you here and bad for you here here at the same time. It was, he looked at them for help. He did not have the necessary word. A dilemma, Wendy asked gent gently, when neither choice seemed any good. Yes, that he nodded, believed. Wendy said, the day that you trimmed the hedges, Danny and I had talked in the truck. The day the first real snow came, remember? Jack nodded. The day he had trimmed the hedges was very clear in his mind. Wendy sighed, I guess you we didn't talk enough, did we, Doc? Danny, the pitcher of woe, shook his head. Exactly what did you talk about, Jack? asked. I'm not sure how much I like my wife and son. Discussing how much they love you? Whatever it was, I don't understand it. I feel like I came into a movie just after the intermission. We were discussing you, Wendy said quietly. And maybe we didn't say it all in words, but we both knew. Me, because I'm your wife, and Danny, because he just understands things. Jack was silent. Danny said it was right. The place seemed good for you. You were away from all the pressures that made you so unhappy at Stovington. You were your own boss, working with your hands so you could save your brain, all of your brain, for your evening's writing. Then I don't know just when the place began to seem bad for you, spending all that time down in the cellar, sifting through those old papers, all that history, talking in your sleep. Am I sleep, Jess? gasped. His face wore a cautious, startled expression. I talk in my sleep. Most of it is slurry. Once I got up to see, use the bathroom and you were saying to hell with it. 
Bring in the slots, at least. No one will know, and no one will ever know. Another time he woke me right up, practically yelling, Unmask, unmask, unmask. Jesus Christ, he said. I rubbed a hand over his face. He looked ill. All your old drinking habits, too. Chewing, etc., and wiping your mouth all the time. Cranky in the morning, and you haven't been able to finish the play yet, have you? No, not yet, but it's only a matter of time. I've been thinking about something else. A new project. This hotel. The project Al Shockley called you about. The one he wanted you to drop. How do you know about that? Jack barked. Were you listening in? You No, she said. Couldn't have listened in if I wanted to. And you'd know that if you were thinking straight. Danny said, Danny and I were downstairs that night. The switchboard is shut. It's shut down. Our phone upstairs was the only one in the hotel that was working. Because it's pit patched directly into the outside line. You told me so yourself. Then how could you... Know what Al told me. Danny told me. Danny knew. The same way he sometimes knows when things are misplaced or when people are thinking about divorce, the doctor said. She shook her head impatiently. The doctor was full of shit and we both know it. We've known it all along, all the time. Remember when Danny said he wanted to see the fire trucks? That was no hunch. He was a baby. He knows things. And now I'm afraid. She looked at the bruises on Danny's neck. Did you really know Uncle Al had called me Danny? Danny nodded. He was really mad, Daddy, because you called Mr. Almond. Mr. Almond called him. Uncle Al didn't want you to write anything about the hotel. Jesus, Jackson, again, the bruises, Danny. Who tried to strangle you? Danny's face went dark. Hurry, said the woman in that room in 217, the dead lady. Excuse me. I don't think I can find where I was going. Okay. His lips began to tremble again, and he seized the teacup and drank. Jack and Wendy exchanged a scared look over his bowed head. Do you think anything about this? Do you know anything about this? He asked her, shook her head. No, not about this, no. Danny he raised the boy's frightened face. Try, son. We are right here. I knew it was bad here, Danny said in a low voice, ever since we were in Boulder, because Tony gave me dreams about it. What dreams? Can't remember any th everything. He shows me the oval look at night with a skull and crossbones on the front. And there's pounding, something I don't remember what, chasing after me, a monster. Tony showed me about red rum. What's that, dog? Wendy asked. Shook his head, I don't know. Rum, like yo-ho-ho and a bottle of rum, Jack asked. And Danny shook his head again, I don't know. Then we got here, Mr. Halloran talked to me in his car because he has the shine, too. It's shine? It's, Danny made a sweeping, all-encompassing gesture with his hands. It's being able to understand things, to know things. Sometimes you see things, like me knowing Uncle Al called, and Mr. Halloran knowing you call me Doc. Mr. Halloran, he was peeling potatoes in the army when he knew his brother got killed in a train crash, and when he called home, it was true. Holy God, Jack whispered, you're not making this up, are you, Doc? Dan. Danny shook his head violently. No, I swear to God. Then with a touch of pride, he added, Mr. Halloran said I had the best shine of anyone he ever met. We could talk back and forth at each other without hardly opening our mouths. Excuse me. His parents looked at each other again, frankly stunned. Mr. Halloran got me alone because he was worried, Danny went on. He said this was a bad place for people who shine. He said he'd seen things. I saw something, too, right after I talked to him. When Mr. Ullman was talking, was taking us around... What was it? Just Jack asked. In the presidential suite on the wall by the door going into the bathroom, bedroom, a whole lot of blood and some other stuff. Gushy stuff, I think. That's the gushy stuff must that, that the gushy stuff must have been brains. Oh my god, Jack said. Wendy was now very pale, her lips nearly grey. This place, Jack said, some pretty bad types owned it a while back. Organization people from Las Vegas. Crooks, Danny asked? Yeah, crooks. I looked at Wendy. In 1966, a big-time hood named Vito Ginelli got killed up there, along with his two bodyguards. There was a picture in the newspaper. Danny just described the picture. Mr. Halloran said he saw, he saw some other stuff, Danny told them. Once about the, about the playground, once there was something bad in that room, 217. A maid saw it and lost her job because she talked about it. So Mr. Halloran went up and he saw it too, but he didn't talk about it because he didn't want to lose his job. Except he told me never to go in there, but I did. 
because I believed him when he said the things who saw here couldn't hurt you. This last was this last was nearly whispered in a low, husky voice, and Danny touched a puff circle of bruises on his face on his neck. What about the playground? Jack asked in a strange, casual voice. I don't know. The playground, he said, and the hedge animals. Jack jumped a little, and Wendy looked at him curiously. Have you seen anything down there, Jack? No, he said, nothing. Danny was looking at him. Nothing, he said again more calmly, and that was true. He'd been the victim of a hallucination, that was all. Danny, we have to hear about the woman, Wendy said again. So Danny told them, but his words came in cyclic bursts, sometimes almost verging on incomprehensible garble in his blurt and his hurry to spit it out and be free of it. He pushed tighter and tighter against his mother's breast as he talked. I went in, he said. I stole the passkey and went in. It was like I couldn't help myself. I had to know, and she, and she the lady, was in the tub. She was dead, all, all swelled up. She was nun nah, didn't have no clothes on. He looked miserably at his mother, and she started to get up, and she wanted me. I know she did because I could feel it. She wasn't even thinking, not the way you and Daddy think. It was black. It was a hurt think, like, like the wasps that night in my room, only wanting to hurt, like the wasps. He swallowed, and there was silence for a moment, all quiet while the image of the wasps sank into them. So I ran, Danny said. I ran, but the door was closed. I left it open, but it was closed. I didn't think about just opening it again and running out. I was scared, so I just I leaned against the door and closed my eyes and thought about how Mr. Halloran said the things here were just like pictures in a book. And if I kept <coughs> saying to myself, you're not there, go away, you're not there, she would go away, but it didn't work. His voice began to rise hysterically. She grabbed me, turned me around. I could see her eyes, how her eyes were, and she started to choke me. I could smell her, and I could smell how dead she was. <coughs> Stop now, shh, Wendy said alarmed. Stop, Danny, it's all right. It. She was getting ready to go into her croon again, the Wendy Torrance all-purpose croon, pat pending. Let him finish, Jack said curtly. There isn't any more, Danny said. I passed out, either because she was choking me or just because I was scared. When I came to, I was dreaming you and Mommy were fighting over me, and you wanted, and just, you wanted to do the bad thing again, Daddy. Then I knew it wasn't a dream at all, and I was awake, and I wet my pants. I wet my pants like a baby. His head fell back against Wendy's sweater, and he began to cry with horrible weakness. His hands lying limp and spent in his lap. Jack got up. Take care of him. What are you going to do? His face was full of dread. I'm going up to that room. What do you think I'm I was going to do? Have coffee? No, don't, Jack. Please don't. Wendy, if there's someone else in the hotel, we have to know. Don't you dare leave us alone, she shrieked at him. Spittle flew from her lips with the force of her cry. Jack said, Wendy, that's a remarkable imitation of your mom. She burst into tears then, unable to cover her face because Danny was on her lap. Sorry, Jack said, but I have to, you know. I am the goddamn caretaker. It's what I'm paid for. She only cried harder and left her that way, going out of the kitchen, rubbing his mouth with his handkerchief as the door swung shut behind him. Don't worry, Mommy, Danny said. He'll be all right. He doesn't shine. Nothing here can hurt him. Through her tears, she said, No, I don't believe that. It's the end of chapter 29. We are going to stop there. And next week, we're going to get into chapter 30. Maybe tomorrow, we'll see. Get into chapter 30, and that's 217 revisited. And then chapter 31, which is super short the verdict, and then the bedroom. But anyway, if you enjoyed this video, please be sure to hit the like button, subscribe, comment below, hit the notification bell, and stay tuned for more. You have a great night. Thank you.